The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And, oh, my goodness, so many things are happening. It's just about the end of the year. I can't believe that. (laughs) It's so strange to me. I'm still trying to figure it out. And oh my gosh, I've got my beaut- I've got some chai tea here. Yes, I've been sort of slurping on this every Friday for the last oh a few weeks. But you know, it's so great. It's so delicious for the winter cold season. I'm still in the Pacific Northwest enjoying snow and things like that for a real end of the year winter festivities. So what are you curled up staying warm tonight? Because like I said, a brand new show every Friday, seven PM Eastern time. And tonight, one of our all-time favorite, favorite, favorite people (laughs) is on the show. (laughs) Whatever comes out of her mouth, I just am always awestruck. And so we've left the topic a little bit open, but I wanted to talk about, you know, getting ready for the new year. I think the new year causes a lot of anxiety, like, Even for me, going, I had so many plans, and some of them are not even started. Others are half done. Others got done, so woo-hoo. But now I'm thinking about, okay, the new year. And I find that it really kind of makes me a little bit anxious. I have to stop and settle down. So I invited Valerie Shepard, and she is the number one best-selling author, catastrophic stroke survivor, inspirational keynote speaker, university lecturer, and certified laughter yoga instructor. (laughs) (laughs) When you meet Valerie, she's the best laugh. Isn't that the best laugh? I can't help but laugh when I hear her laugh. Anyway, Valerie is also a master of improv, which I absolutely love to watch her do her improv. She just cracks me up every time. Anyway, and she is just absolutely one of the most multifaceted people I have ever met. And her passion is life mastery, where she teaches you the four-step happy-to-be me process. It's a centerpiece of her partnership with the University of California, Irvine, and is much loved in the successful class called Living 101, Being Happy and Whole. And she has a brand new bestseller out. I think you got it right there behind you, don't you? Yeah, yes, uh, yeah, I am. yeah. Living happy to be me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so I know you've been on this show before, Valerie. And so thank you so much for coming back uh, right here at the end of the year and everything. Um, we don't have to go into great detail, but you know, people are going to go catastrophic stroke survivor. Uh, you are just what I call, you know, here we don't call us survivors; we're thrivers. That's and right. Your trip through the catastrophic stroke and how you came out the other side is awe-inspiring. Just awe-inspiring. Thank you. So just share a little bit of what it was like. I mean, I know your story, but just share with the audience. Oh my gosh, I can't can't imagine what happened. Yes, it was, um, well, and it continues, right? The the journey continues because I'm not back to a whatever back to I'm not at a hundred percent recovery as I would like to experience it so it continues two and a half years later but the the um, experience was <laughs> quite riveting um, I was teaching a an all-day facilitating an all-day leadership workshop and um, in the middle of it it was around 2 30 in the afternoon I um, was backing up and all of a sudden my right foot wouldn't move and um, I almost fell down but I got put into a chair so I never hit the ground and I just kept running through like have I eaten enough have I had enough water today what you know what's going on here and we couldn't figure it out and um, it was a pretty crazy next couple of uh, months and um, it was a stroke and the the um, when the EMTs got there, they couldn't move me because I was vomiting and I had had a blood vessel burst in my brain. And so the vomiting was a part of the blood pooling around my brain. And um, I was out for a few days, three days, four days. And I woke up and I couldn't use my right side at all, couldn't speak. Or I spoke gibberish, which was pretty funny. My brain was formulating words in my head and I was speaking them and they sounded fine to me, but I looked around me and people's faces were kind of perplexed and it's so funny, it was gibberish, which is, you know, the the language of improv comedy So <laughs> and laughter yoga. So <laughs> we're doing, um, I was doing gibberish and 
but I thought I was speaking real. Um, oh, that's fascinating language. to me, as if almost another part of your brain, that improv part of you, that humor part of you, the laughter part of you, was trying to take over, was trying to, you know, like, jump in and say, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do this. Well, that's interesting that you say that, Sharon, too, because um, the thought that I had when I realized that I couldn't speak right was, um, wow, I'm a speaker, teacher, healer, and I can't speak. And then I, the very next thought was, well, if Stephen Hawking can do it, so can I. Bravo, and, that's my Valerie. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of went back out, and then I woke up another day later, and believe it or not, my speech all dropped in like a brick. It just went boom, came back. Wow. I never went to speech therapy. Actually, I did go to speech therapy one day. They tested me and said, why are you in speech therapy? And I said, <laughs> well, I think they wanted to rule out that I needed it. And so she was like, yeah, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Check that off the list, right? <laughs> it's really, um, it's been quite a journey and um, it has come into play in so many aspects of my life. And uh, I know for a fact that this stroke has come to give me an opportunity to, you know, do what I say, um, double down on the things that I teach. So I was already doing my darndest to embody the things that I speak about. That to me is part of my integrity and authenticity commitment to the people that I serve. And then um, the, the stroke has just given me an opportunity to go even deeper into, into everything that I teach. So um, it, it really is funny that you say that, that like this, this funny aspect of me took over and allowed me to go to a higher plane, to see things with a, a lot more possibility and, and light and peace and reverence, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today that's necessary when you're in any kind of transition, but certainly in this year end to the new year transition. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I just want to touch on this for a minute because I've heard it from other guests about how their life changed in a positive way after a diagnosis, that there was this opportunity for them to reassess their life and reevaluate their life and some stayed on the same path and others often said hmm no I'm really going to follow this passion I've had a long time or or in my case with I'm still doing my communications work but I know I mean the autoimmune hour wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my autoimmune condition and so it's always interesting to me hmm, how we you know, we, we try to predict the future, but we can't. <laughs> We're so lousy at it. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit around. Um, I know you're a big advocate of following our gifts. So let's, we'll start on that, and then we'll go into how do we prepare for the new year and maybe get over this angst about, oh, my goodness, one more year down. Oh, my goodness, how am I going to do this new year? So let's start a little bit about, you know, just, learning to find our gifts and accepting them. It's interesting. It seems strange to me to even have to say, can we find and accept our gifts? And um, I think part of that is because we're conditioned to go after what we do well. And maybe um, the things that are really our gifts are these latent things that we've never really cultivated. And so, for me, for example, you know, there are things that I have not cultivated uh, that could potentially be a kind of gift. You know, the improv comedy was one of them. I hadn't even done it. It kind of scared me when I first started doing it. I was like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? And, and at the time, I was so in my head a lot that, you know, the idea of uncensored going with the impulse, which is what improv is, going, performing at that level was very terrifying to me. But it's turned out to be something that I really love doing. I'm not the best at it, but I really enjoy it, and I'm pretty good. I won a couple you're, awards. And you're I've more had than a, pretty good. You're, you're awesome. I just, <laughs> Thank you. Because I'm mesmerized. I, see, I think since I know Valerie, and I watch her up there on stage, I'm just like, wow, that's just Valerie per personified. I mean. <laughs> mm, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, and 
Well, I'm going to ask about the improv for just a quick sec, because that always fascinates me. Mm. Some of the tips you've shared for us on how to improv our life. Can you just share a couple of your top tips so we can just get past this idea of improv, but how to improv your life? (laughs) Well, you know, improv is a big, uh, the number one rule in improv is yes and. And what that means is no matter what your partner does, improv is not an individual sport. It's a team sport or at least a pair And so no matter what your partner offers you in that scene, your job is to say yes and. Now, we don't necessarily literally say that on stage, but what you see is this beautiful dance of people accepting what is offered and then building on it. And that's what yes and is about. So in life, the way that turns, uh, the way that looks is things that come at you, and whether that's a catastrophic illness or experience, or whether that's a wonderful love partner, or beautiful day, or a rainy day, whatever comes at you, we are in the posture of yes, and how do I add to this experience for myself and make it better? How do I add to this experience for others and make it better? So yes and is the number one thing. And I think the number two thing is the power of really listening and listening not just with your ears but with your whole countenance like what is your body telling you what are you feeling that the world the universe is giving to you as a potential message and or a message filled with gifts that you can then turn into the next wonderful exquisite experience in your day oh my gosh beautiful Beautiful. <laughs> you know, I'm going to stop there and just soak that in. I'm a little early for the commercial break, <clears throat> but I'm going to stop here. And Valerie has been sharing with us so many things about finding our gifts. I'm, I was just awestruck there, so I broke a little early for the commercial, so I could just let that soak in. Thank you so much, this idea of approaching life with yes and, because I think I know as I'm getting older, it's sometimes a little hard for me to uh, say yes and. Sometimes I, I want to get a little stuck in my way, shall I say. <laughs> or, well, yeah, and sometimes what we're used to saying a lot is yes, but. Yeah, yeah but. Yeah, but. And it, it completely changes the direction. It puts a halt in the middle of what you're doing, and it makes you kind of turn around and go in another direction. And... Um, getting ourselves into the habit of greeting everything with uh, three words that I call critical to having a happy and whole life, accepting, allowing, and receiving. We have to, and the accepting, allowing, and receiving. And the yes and sets us up to do that. To just say, okay, like when I woke up and couldn't talk, okay, well, I'm a person who does, who needs to talk for what she does, and we'll figure this out. (laughs) Oh, well, it's just not speaking today. Guess I'll go back to sleep. And so the more that we can get in that posture, the more we can actually receive the gifts that are coming to us. And so we talked a little bit before the break about how do we even identify our gifts. And my suggestion was that some of us have latent gifts because we've been focused on what we're good at. Sometimes those are one and the same. What we're good at is also our gift. But in other ways, what we're good at is not necessarily the only gift. It's, it's actually something we've cultivated, and the gift may be laying there dormant and wanting us to, to pick it up and dance with it a little bit more. That's why my book is called Dancing Your Soul Light Style. It's like, what is calling you into a dance that were you to go with it, yes, and if you were to go with it, would have more happiness, more fulfillment, more success, more joy and tolerance and harmony and compassion and all the beautiful things that life constantly has to offer. Oh, I love that. And I'm thinking a couple of things came to my mind while we were or while I was listening to that. One of them I often hear though are people like oh, I would love to fill in the blank, you know, go back to painting, or I really love to do this as a child, or something like this. But I'm afraid. You notice there was a but. Yeah, but. That was the yes, but. Yes, I would love to do this, but. But I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And the yes and is lovely. And then then I'm thinking of someone I was coaching the other day when 
I realized for whatever reason they needed what I'll metaphorically call a net under them to know that it was safe to jump. What other tips do you have for people who are still kind of, Valerie, I hear you, but. <laughs> right. Okay. So a couple things. First thing is, yes, and doesn't eliminate the fear. Oh, I'm glad you bring that up. Somehow. It doesn't I eliminate the fear. It just sets you up to accept and allow the fear. Fear is natural. I don't know where we got into this idea that we shouldn't be afraid of things. We can have fear. The question is not whether we have the fear. It's how we respond to the fear. Does the fear stop us in our tracks, make us run for the hills, shut us down, telling us, no, this isn't something I should do? Or does the fear just move? It's just an energy. It's just a part of the whole universe spectrum of energies, just like happiness and joy are energies. So the fear, yes, Valerie, I would love to paint again, and I'm feeling afraid of that. Cool. What's the fear about? Now we can actually go in to create a relationship with the fear, an understanding of it, and an opportunity to let it dissipate. Not to completely eliminate it or, you know, like push it away, pushed away, resistance, law of the universe says whatever we resist persists. So it's much better for us to say, embrace the fear. Hello, fear, my old friend. You've actually helped me in the past. My lifetime friend. (laughs) Well, you've actually helped me in the past, right? I I don't need to push you aside. You've actually protected me, saved my life. You've helped me. Now I really want to understand what it is I'm afraid of and why. And then create a relationship with it that actually supports me to do that which serves me at the highest and best levels. Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that because I do hear that a lot. And I too have walked through my own fears. And at times I have to stop and maybe that conversation gets a little extended <laughs> past the length, the length of time. I, maybe other parts of me wish it would. So. We well, you know it, it like a lot of times what we're fighting is the subconscious or unconscious memory we have of a situation like the one we're facing in the current moment that happened a long time ago, like between the ages of zero and six, a long time ago when something scared us and whatever happened shut us down. And so we left a fragment of our whole selves way back in that time period. And until we reunite with that inner child's pain, inner child's fear, inner child's shutdown, disenfranchisement, until we reunite with that, our life is trying to show us that we're not whole. And if we react to everything that our life is showing us with a sense of recoil and a sense of kind of push that aside, I want to get over there, keep going where I'm going, we're missing out on an opportunity to be that which we really are seeking every day anyway. So now is a way to, as we look at it, let's see how we in French, like pull it in and love it. That's the way we love ourselves back into wholeness. Oh, beautiful. Oh, see, uh, these questions are just flying out of my brain because I get mesmerized with you always, Valerie. Mm. <laughs> Let's talk a little. I just love that. Okay. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, guys, this will be part of the transcribe tribe because this is stuff that, you know, you can hear it, mm. but you want to be able to re-listen to Valerie again and again, and then I'm definitely going to be part of the transcribe tribe, guys. So anyway, Thank that's you. a little side note there. So Valerie, as we're looking at this past year and the things that we want to set up to be able to do for ourselves and follow those gifts and follow those maybe and maybe even un- uncover things that we haven't been willing to look at as we're setting ourselves up for the new year what kinds of tips do you share with people because I always worry gosh it's such a big time everyone you know is setting resolutions it almost feels to me I don't know sort of both anticlimactic and overwhelming all at the same time mm-hmm. You know, I uh, have a relationship with resolutions. They don't happen on New Year's Eve. They happen on my birthday. So one thing that you can do is take the whole resolution process out of January 1st and December 31st and just make them about you, not about the rest of the world. 
just put them on your birthday. It's something that you do for you. And it's about your next year. The next year of you is going to be different in what ways. So that helps take that New Year's resolution pressure off of, of this transition from December 31st to January 1st. The other thing is, I think um, one of the things that my clients tell me is when they're concerned about the future, whether it's this New Year's Day transition or just anything in the future, there's something that they don't think they're capable of doing that the future's gonna call on them to do. And so we often spend time getting clear on, again, what is this, you know, underneath anxiety, the base emotion is fear. We're back to the same word. People call it frustration, anxiety, worry, overwhelm. All of those have at the bottom some idea of I'm not going to be enough to get this done. I'm not going to have enough money to take care of this. I'm not going to have figured out this problem in order to move beyond it. It's all around this sort of lack limitation, limiting beliefs, limiting thoughts, and fear. And again, when we can kind of open, peel back the peel on it and get to its core and make peace with that. And one of the things, one of the biggest tools that I use for people in this space is this thing that I call, I can, I have, I am thinking. I can, I have, I am. And it basically takes a page from a previous chapter in your book where you have overcome some difficulty or you've figured something out, you've found the path that you were looking for, and it says use that to remind yourself you've done it before, you can do it again, and then claim it in the moment. I can overcome obstacles. In fact, I have overcome an obstacle just like this one. Right now, I claim I am overcoming this obstacle. And so I can, I have, I am um, thinking as a way to shift limiting beliefs into something much more positive and affirmative. Oh, that's beautiful. I can, I have, I am. I am. Yeah, I'm coming up with quotes for Twitter left and right here. <laughs> this is awesome. So I can, I have, I am. And you know, that just, even just saying that, I haven't had the chance here in our, it, because of our interview to really reflect on something that I might choose to use that with. But somehow just saying that is very freeing. Even it really without, is. And the most important part is to get into the present. So we spend time at the holidays and in New Year's doing a whole bunch of retrospective analysis, looking backwards, and a whole bunch of anticipation of the future, planning and anticipation. And we forget to be present. And what I like about the I can, I have, I am is it ends with I am, which is in the present moment, claiming that which we, we intend to, to create. And so it's a positive, affirmative statement of a present moment situation, circumstance, and this is what we're going to do. And so I love the I am statement as a way of saying, I am doing this. And, and maybe we're doing it one tiny little bite at a time, but that's all we need to do is one tiny little bite at a time. And that's probably my second tip, Sharon, is I have my clients sit down and as they map out, okay, let's say the whole thing is I want to lose 10 pounds. And let's say they decide the goal is to lose 10 pounds by March 1st. Okay, great. So instead of thinking about all 10 pounds, why don't we break it down into some constituent points where you get a chance to see oh, I'm on track or I'm off track. What happens is, I know this is true for me, I can put on 10 pounds without even noticing it. And then all of a sudden, a pair of pants doesn't fit. And it's because I've been having a lot of fun with my food and drink and maybe not as much energy has been put into my exercise. And so if we break it down into more um, chewable mouth pieces, mouth bites, um, how am I going to lose one pound? And then when I lose one pound, hallelujah, I celebrate without eating and drinking. I celebrate a different way. And then how am I going to lose one pound? It adds up. One pound, one pound, one pound eventually gets me to 10. But somehow, psychologically, 10 feels really huge. But one feels doable. And so if we can break things down into smaller chunks, you know, that saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? That's the way. <laughs> That's what we're doing. 
I like that. I like that. How do I lose one pound? That's How do I lose 10 pounds? Just deal with one at a time. Yeah, just deal one at a time. I love that. It, it does make it feel... And I would imagine being that I can, I have, I am plays into that because the first you look at the scale, you're like, oh, I lost a pound. I can. I have. I am. And so I could see how it could build upon itself because mm -hmm. you proved to yourself moments ago that you lost that one pound. So I imagine the next second, third, or fourth pounds would exponentially become a little bit quicker or something. I'm not sure. Just sort of rinse and repeat goes through my mind. <laughs> oh, I love rinse and repeat. It's definitely when something's working for us, it's really a good idea to keep doing it. And then just can we build on it? What else? How else can I make this better for me? What more is possible in my I can, I have, I am equation? What more is possible? And I think um, when you when you talk about this journey that all of us is on from an intention to a goal, uh, one thing that can really disrupt our getting there is when we don't and what we do in response to that. So how do I receive myself, quote unquote, failing? How do I receive myself not achieving something that I intended to achieve? And those little memories of how that feels, believe it or not, can be one of the biggest things in the way of where we're going. Our yesterdays can get in the way of our todays and tomorrows if we let them. And so being able to receive ourselves, and by that I mean love and accept and nurture and honor ourselves, even in the midst of a failure, even in the midst of a, well, I didn't do that one pound so well, or I didn't do that particular um, thing I wanted to do so well. Let's see um, what got in the way and how do I do it differently? So it's a, again, a yes and. Yes, I didn't do that so well. And what am I doing about it now? What am I learning from it? What did it come to teach me? I just love your use of language. I'm just, sorry, I'm still mesmerized, folks. Okay. I, I, hope, I hope you guys are, too, because you can see why I wanted Valerie on for this uh, show, the end of the year show here. This is Thank so you. awesome. I love this receive yourself. I, I've never mm. heard it termed that way. And there again, there was a whole relaxing in my body as you said it the second time. The first time it took a second to sink in. And as you said it the second time, there was this complete, energetic relaxation that happened as so I just love your use of language it is so important how we talk about ourselves and the world that we're in well uh, we hear everything we say and every thought we have every other person probably doesn't because a lot of times we're talking to ourselves in our homes or our offices and in our heads and so nobody else can hear it um, but we do and <laughs> it's powerful language that which we say to ourselves about ourselves it's hugely powerful and so this whole idea of receiving oneself it's it's be it's telling yourself that you are perfect whole and complete as you are and it doesn't mean that you per, personally i think we're all perfect anyway and so that means no matter what situation we're going through or what we're in, in, excuse me, in um, we can be anything that we say we can be. We just have to stick with it. So for me, this whole idea of my healing, like receiving myself when I first went to the rehab hospital, and I actually went there thinking they were going to teach me how to be a person whose right side of her body never worked again. I mean, I really thought that mm. and um, very quickly found out, no, you're not paralyzed. We just have to tell your brain to talk to your nerves and muscles again, and we can see what, how far we can go with it. But at first I was really, you know, I was totally in the space of allowing, accepting, receiving that this is where I am. Like, I might be in a wheelchair forever. And it's not like every single day is like that. Believe me, I have days where I'm sick of it. My hand still shakes and I've, I've broken countless things and knocked plates over. You know, I've done so many different things and I'm like, wow, this is hilarious. Um, 
And I still have to receive myself where I am, which is my body does what it does. Um, I won't say my body doesn't work. I will say my body is in this space of healing. And so the unhealed aspects of it still do some interesting things and aren't always at my command. And um, I'm willing to love it and be compassionate with it. And I talk to my little right hand and, and uh, ask it to watch the left hand doing things and see if I can, <laughs> you know, get them synced up to doing things the, the same way. And um, it actually feels good. Oh my uh, gosh. We got to take a quick commercial break, folks, but we'll leave on that note of like, the, I love that idea of asking your right hand to look at your left hand and <laughs> see, this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Literally, that was the conversation I literally had. Oh, that's still def have. It's definitely the, the I can, I have, I am for sure. My mm -hmm. left hand, is, let's see, right side. <laughs> let's practice it. Uh -huh. so, anyway, let's take this quick commercial break, folks. We'll be right back in just a minute. Welcome back from that quick commercial break there, Valerie. I had a place that I wanted to go. So we're, we've um, worked through the idea of uh, our gifts and coming uh, to be able to receive those and accept those. And we've talked about fear and the beautiful phrase, I can, I have, I am as well. And receiving ourselves. What a wonderful way to look at it. I'm just not going to come up with a question. I want you to just to share a couple of tips that you have when people come to you and they say, we talked about weight loss and things, but what if they just say, Valerie, I want this really, really big goal and I have broken it down into steps before. And for some reason, I keep getting sidetracked. And I'm going to throw in this idea of other people because I know that you have a lot of interesting insights about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not your word for them, but that would be my word for them. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, the centerpiece of my work is that our relationship with ourselves establishes everything else that we experience in our lives. So the other people in our lives are a reflection of the way we treat ourselves. Wow. So in a relationship or when there are situations where our boundaries are being uh, stepped on, the first thing I do with my clients is say, okay, so how is this a reflection of how you treat you? How is this showing you you? You think it's that person who doesn't return your phone calls, um, but is it you who doesn't answer your call? Like your body tells you it's time to go to sleep, but you power through and push yourself to work another four hours, not once in a while, but every day. Like how are you not answering your own phone call from your physical body or from your emotional body says, you need to take a break and release yourself from some um, negative vibration that's inside you, but you neither do it yourself nor get together with a coach or a healer or anyone else to help you do it. So you're not answering your own call. And so in your relationships, you notice, wow, nobody's getting back to me. That's your life speaking to you. And it's using you as an example. And that's one of the natural, universal, spiritual laws of the universe. Um, wow. Now, I'm just so fascinated because uh, when you first were going down with that metaphor, I thought, yeah, there's sometimes I look at my phone and I don't answer the phone call coming my way. But you took it a completely different place in a much broader vision of how are you not answering for yourself. Yeah. And this goes right full circle back to that gifts conversation that we started with. How many times are we getting a call from the inner that's saying, hey, let's dance. Hey, let's go play. Hey, let's draw. Hey, let's do this. And something intellectually inside us or fear, emotional fear, shuts that down. We don't answer that call. And so we end up wondering, why is my life my life? I don't even like my job. 
Why am I doing it? Well, maybe because you haven't answered the call that's been coming over and over from your inner being. And you may have had some really good reasons. I don't know how I'm going to make money at it. Oh, that's something I did when I was a kid. I could never do it now. I love playing piano, but I could never be a Mozart. Well, maybe you're not supposed to be. But maybe what happens when you play piano frees up some energy in your system and allows you to connect to you in a different way, which means all those other things you're doing flow better. And so we can get into a very tight space of living where we've mapped out the minutes and we know on Saturday we're supposed to do this, on Tuesday we're supposed to do that, and we haven't left enough room to organically create in the present moment. And so it really helps to be able to look at the calendar when we wake up and say, yeah, I did plan my day this way. Is this still what's calling to me? in this moment to be the highest and best expression of me. And sometimes you can't change everything. I just um, finished a quarter where I taught four classes and there was a lot that I was saying no to because I had said yes to teaching those four classes and it was a lot. And there were days when I had to be in, I mean, I have to be in class. It's like that has to happen. But other things around that where I had put them on the calendar, I gave myself total permission to say, uh, this isn't going to work and, and to cancel if I have to. And that's a part of that answering the call from within. I'm too tired. I, it's not working for me and making yourself important. And some really interesting things happen. Uh, my clients tell me this and my experience is this as well. I often call in to cancel something or reschedule it. And what I hear from the other person is, Oh my God, thank goodness you're canceling because I really am so busy and I just didn't want to cancel because I thought you would be upset. Oh, I'll raise my hand. Heard that oftentimes myself. <laughs> Isn't that it really is. It's important. I mean, little things going to the movies with friends. If you, you know, people love this word compromise. Well, I don't really want to see that movie and the, they don't want to see the movie I want to see, so we'll compromise and pick one we can both go see. But in the end, unless you both really love that movie, you're wasting your money and your time. You'd be better off coming up with something else to do together or each of you going to the movie you want to go to and then meeting up afterwards. I mean, there are lots of ways to get around this where you're actually giving yourself what yourself asked for instead of giving yourself something less than and trying to make the best of it. When you have the, when you're the master and commander, or I tell my female students, mistress and commandress of your life, <laughs> you, you get to choose. And so the question is, what are you choosing? And in relationship, there are far too many times when we choose the other instead of the self. And that means we're giving to the other with a less than full whole cup. And that usually doesn't work. Yeah, no, the first thing that came to my mind when you said giving to the other was I remember being programmed as a young girl. I can't speak for what it would be like for a young male, but for a young girl, um, things like be nice, be kind, uh, share your doll, you're being selfish, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think about how that plays into my choices, especially the, my early uh, adulthood choices of how I navigated my life, that a lot of it was answering these questions. Am I being nice? Am I being kind? I don't want to share, but here you can have my doll. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's really interesting because that is, you hit a really big one for me. Uh, whenever I'm with my friends who have children and they say, give Auntie Valerie a kiss, and I'm like, don't make that child give me a kiss if they don't want to. We're teaching them to people please and to be more interested in what the other person's needs and desires are than in listening to their own voice. I'm okay if, they, if they're afraid of me. I'm like four feet taller than them, dark complexion, dark hair. If they're not used to seeing me, um, there's a little bit of a fear factor. And so you are bringing up exactly what um, people say to me a lot. Um, back in my childhood, I was conditioned to just kind of meet other people's needs, and I feel like I've done that my whole life. And it doesn't really work because we end up, at least for me, it didn't really work. I ended up feeling 
empty and um, discontented. And honestly, Sharon, a little, a little or a lot resentful. I mean, I used to do, when I would go on vacation, I would take a lot of money, uh, spending money, and 80% of my spending money was spent on other people. Gifts to bring back. Um, a long time ago when I used to actually mail postcards from Europe to people in the United States. So finding a postcard, getting the postage, finding a post office in a foreign country, mailing back to the United States, that was a part of my vacation. And I would be resentful that no one ever sent me a postcard from their vacations and um, no one ever brought me gifts back. And then that set up resentment and I had to look at well, what's the problem? Oh, I'm being quote unquote a better friend than they're being to me. No, actually I'm just doing a conditioned behavior of if I do this, they will love me. And then I figured out, no, the person who's most responsible for loving me is me. Wow, what a great story, too. That's such a, a profound story and one of those stories where I think most of us can relate. Maybe we haven't gone on vacation with postcards, but that idea of we're the ones that call our friends. We're, we always go to, the, well, I'm the one that always calls or uh, uh -huh. I haven't heard from so-and-so in, in five months, but I, I've made the last five calls. I'm not calling her until she calls me and years go by. It's That's fascinating how that how that works. Uh, go ahead and just tell us more about how people could work with you and find your book. And then we'll just close with a couple of final thoughts. So what were you going okay. to share right before we hit the clock? <laughs> well, you know, this, this whole idea of the other is reflecting us. It's, 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 it's sometimes hard for people to kind of grasp it. Um, but when they dig below the surface with the, with the total yes and posture, wow, that is what I'm seeing out there. What is it showing me about me inside? And then being willing to go inside and shift it, worlds can open up and things change. And this whole idea of loving self, my mom would, used to tell me this when she would be upset with my brother. He doesn't call me enough. And, um, and I would say to her, well, do you want to talk to him? And she said, yeah. And I said, then pick up the phone and call. <laughs> and she would be like, well, you know, and this is what I say to all of us. It, we're not responsible for the other person's choices. And we can't hold the other to our standard. If it makes us happy, if we feel joy in our heart to spend time with someone, to speak to someone, to share ourselves with this other, then do it. And not as a conditional love, meaning... I give and then you give and then I give and then you give and we have to be 50-50 and then it'll be okay. No, unconditional love means unconditional love. So that means I love because I love for no other reason. Not because you give me something or call me a certain number of times or answer a certain way. I just do it because I am love and that's what I choose to do. And if I want to talk to you in a loving relationship, I will just call you up and talk to you and I won't hold it as a tit for tat or some shit over top of you that I called the last 32 times because I'm not actually <laughs> doing it to get something. If I'm doing it to get something, I'm not really giving, I'm taking. If I'm calling you so that eventually you'll call me back and I'll feel like we're in a great relationship together, that's not the same. In unconditional love, I just want to love. So I love our conversation, so I'm going to call you. And that's enough. And so at this time of year, there can be a lot of um, scorekeeping. Yes. There can be a lot of scorekeeping. And I would encourage and invite all of us to see how we can put that down and let that go. And if we want to keep score of anything, just watch ourselves. That's enough because the rest of the world is our reflection. So if we work on our inner peace, we will start to attract more peaceful situations. When we are in the space of, I am so beautiful, I am so wonderful, I can and I have and I am, we're in the space of positive, powerful, empowered thinking and behavior, we experience that in our relationships and everything around us. And so the scorekeeping let's put that book down and just keep track of how much love 
we're giving to ourselves and to others and see that multiply in our world. Oh, that's a beautiful place to leave that. And I want to make sure we get plenty of time in for to share. I know people are going to be clamoring to know more about you. So how do we find out more about you and get your book? You know, um, I love that question. And my book is available on am- Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. And you can get it at my website at 25% discount. And the website is happytobeme.net. Happy to be me. Dot net. And the other thing you'll find there, there are videos there, things to kind of help you understand kind of the, the philosophy underlying the book and, and how I can support and serve your ascension to your highest and best self. Everyone, employ some of the great tips that uh, Valerie shared with us today. I know they'll make 2018 just go so much smoother. My dear, as always, bless you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. It's awesome. Everyone, thank you. go have a great week, weekend and week, whatever your adventures. And as always, enjoy. The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. You've been listening to Life Interrupted Radio. To learn more, listen to other shows, and gain free resources that can help empower your life, be sure to stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com.